Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 25 playthrough, our mini-series with the Seattle Mariners. And welcome back. As I noted, uh, it's been a few days since our past episode. As I mentioned then, I uh, had some business travel to Texas. Uh, went very well. Always enjoy being in the great state of Texas. Uh, did not get to a Rangers game. Schedule did not allow it, unfortunately but had a very good and productive trip while I was down there. Uh, my trip home uh, turned into quite a saga. The weather did not cooperate very well, and the airlines certainly did not cooperate uh, Friday into Saturday. But by uh, 5 o'clock this morning, including a uh, saga with a relatively long drive in a rental car, I was finally back home after being up for about 24 hours in a row. So if I'm a little groggy and out of it in this episode, that will be my excuse. It'll probably be a relatively quick episode, but did want to get something out there for those of you who have been uh, patiently waiting. I know we had been putting out a pretty torrid pace of episodes for a few weeks, so hopefully my... Temporary absence also allowed uh, some of you to catch up and appreciate uh, all of you who watch, whether this is your uh, first video or your 500th one of our videos that you're watching. And it's been a relatively busy early off season for our Seattle Mariners this year as we try to bounce back from a disappointing 500 season. As we sit here on December 22nd, uh, we've made... A couple of pretty significant moves. Most notably, uh, signed Beau Bichette to be our starting shortstop for the next several years. Also brought on Hunter Renfro via free agency and MJ Melendez in a trade. We think the two of those players will hopefully form a nice platoon that's uh, relatively inexpensive and hopefully relatively productive for us, uh, likely at left or right field. Had some uh, initial positive reviews from a couple of player development programs that were shorter in nature that we were working on with both uh, Cole Young and Juan Soto. Uh, so the two of those gentlemen are in another relatively short program for each of them uh, that we'll hopefully find out in early January how those went. And then we'll have another round of short programs uh, potentially for those two or some other players and then find out what happens in the balance of the programs that were several month long programs that we started right at the beginning of the off season. Kind of left our last episode talking about what we should do in the market for a pitcher. We had the best pitching staff in the American League last year. We've certainly upgraded, we hope, both our offense and defense with the moves that we've made. And there are some interesting pitchers out there. And I noted that I thought Aaron Savale was pretty decent value. Looking for only about $9 million a year to potentially come in and be a fourth or fifth starter for us. Would really give us a top-notch rotation. And the money he's looking for is not excessive. The other guy that we have been kind of looking at over the last... Uh, month at this point scouting um, one time and trying to get a second scouting report on him now to get our scouting accuracy up to that coveted very high level is Yoshihisa Matsuara, a left-handed Japanese pitcher who looks like he's got the profile to be a very effective major league reliever. Some of you have noted that Matsuura could be the stopper that we've wanted through the first couple years of these this uh, Seattle Mariners sim that we haven't necessarily found quite yet. And I do think he could potentially fill that role for us. But even though Savale is not necessarily as high-end a talent at this point, if you look at his stuff and his movement, he certainly doesn't measure up to Matsura, but granted, if Savale was being used in the bullpen, his stuff probably would be similar to Matsuara's. 
but he's a little bit younger. He's definitely cheaper, and he would allow us to fill a role in the rotation, which is valuable. The other reason I may be less inclined to go to Matsura is that when I think about our Mariners team and I think about our ballpark, left-handed batters uh, struggle a bit more than right-handers in this ballpark in terms of both the batting average that they generate in aggregate as well as the number of home runs that they hit. So all else being equal, I'm a little more inclined to bring right-handed pitchers onto the team to just encourage other teams to bat left-handers against us in the 81 home games a year we have in our park. Not a huge factor in the decision-making, but we do already with Gabe Spire, Brennan Bernardino, and Bennett Souza have three left-handers working out of the bullpen that I like reasonably well. And we did while well, we did finish last season with four left-handers in our bullpen, I don't know that it's necessary. I almost feel like uh, bringing Savale onto the team, which likely allows us move to, to move Brian Wu into the bullpen, might be the better move. And it's not inconceivable that a Brian Wu or a Bryce Miller, who have been starters for us the last couple of years, could maybe compete for that stopper role. And certainly the likes of Matt Brash and even Gregory Santos uh, have skill sets that suggest they could handle that role. Although the performance for both of them on the field over the last couple of years hasn't necessarily been the... Uh, lockdown performance I'd prefer to see from a potential stopper. And if we were to go with a lefty in the pin, in the pen, the other thing to note is that AJ Puck is still out there. We had made uh, offers to him early in spring training uh, that he wasn't thrilled with. Uh, we were trying to lock him up for a decent amount of time. But at this point, uh, He's willing to consider a one-year contract rather than the three years that we were thinking about, and the money's not too high. Uh, so I think there is a part of me that if we're going to bring a lefty into the pen, I'd rather do it at a little bit more of a discount level like we could potentially do with Puck rather than going at the really high end of the scale and perhaps ending up paying $12 million-ish or so for Matsura. I don't know that I'm going to push real heavy at either of the left-handers for the bullpen right now. I may kind of bide my time since I think the fact that I like the three lefties out there now, it's a little bit more of a luxury for us. And pitching is a luxury for us in general. I get that. But with the fact that we've got Harry Ford and Cole Young coming to bolster the offense, hopefully, this year from the minor leagues. And then we've added, as I said, Renfro slash Melendez and Bichette into the mix. I feel like on paper, the offense should be better next year, particularly if we also expect both Juan Soto and Glaber Torres to perform better than they did in their first years in Seattle. So while pitching's a bit of a luxury, I don't think it's um, totally irrational for us to look to improve the strength of our team at this point. And Savale is looking for three years at $9 million a pop, including a player option in the final season, as well as some bonuses. We're going to at least uh, start discussions with him at a more team-friendly level and structure and see what his reaction is to that and we put together a more team friendly structure as i noted uh he was looking for three years nine million a pop we're giving him three years seven and a half million average annual value team options for the final two seasons 
We did increase the potential innings bonus to 500,000, um, but we also increased that he needed 180 innings to get that bonus rather than a buck 60. I don't think he'll take this one back to his family, uh, but I don't think it's a bad starting point for us either. And he's actually willing to think about it even better. So we've got an offer out to Savale, um, basically locks him into the rotation for this season. And then after that, we've got a lot of optionality, which is, um, I think, ideal for us at this point. McCullers Jr. is in the last year of his contract with us, and we got Houston to retain most of that. So even if McCullers Jr. ends up... Uh, moving on um, after this season, you know, we've got the option to promote Savale into that fourth role, even if McCullers Jr. is the fourth starter this year, and then likely have Wu and or Miller in the mix next year. But the fact that Savale's contract um, would have team options for those second and third seasons also uh, gives us a little more flexibility regarding what we're going to um, ultimately do with Logan Gilbert, uh, who's set to make close to $18 million next year in his final arbitration eligible season, unlike um, Luis Castillo. And George Kirby. We don't have uh, Gilbert locked up for anything more than this current season at this point. As we've talked about in the past, I think the expectation is that we move on from Cal Rally after this year, which likely lets us keep Gilbert at least next year. But certainly the way the Savale contract is structured um, gives us more options if he ends up agreeing to it to... Uh, Continue hopefully optimizing the way this team looks on paper and more importantly on the virtual field this upcoming season and into the future. And we've simmed ahead almost two weeks. Uh, clearly Savale was not blown away by our offer as he still hasn't even given us a reaction to it yet. Matsura, uh, we're now up to very high scouting accuracy on him. Uh, really impressed with his movement. Think he could definitely be a helpful player for us, but at uh, 14.6-ish million dollars a year, his demand has actually gone up. Uh, looks like Savale's um, maybe moving up a little bit as well. Probably why we haven't heard back from him is he is uh, pursuing more and more money. Uh, and it does look like Puck is off of the list of options for us. Uh, again, not the end of the world. I did like him, particularly his stuff. Uh, but he was fragile. See what he ended up getting. I'm guessing it's going to be you know a one-year deal around a million and a half, if that. Actually, a minor league free agent signing. Uh, I'm assuming it's with a major league option. Yeah, so he got the 1.46 he was looking for. If he does make the major league roster. It's fine that we don't have him. I'm not incredibly concerned about adding a fourth left-handed bullpen arm. That said, if the price on Matsura drops materially. And we maybe don't end up with Savale. We're going to keep our eye on him. I mean, for that matter, we're still keeping our eye on Devin Williams, too, but his salary demands are going to have to likely be more than cut in half before he'll be a realistic option for us to think about. And we have just included those supplemental programs I mentioned, uh, successful for both of them again, uh, Cole Young and Juan Soto. Uh, they both had successful defensive-oriented programs over the first month or so of the offseason. And now Cole Young base stealing and Juan Soto base running programs, both successful as well, which is positive. So as we think about this uh, final potential session in the development lab, 
Uh, you can see we've got six to seven weeks left to go with uh, the other six slots we had with the longer term programs and with the exception of the youngster Cam Caminiti, um, everyone is on track and or excelling. So it could be another very successful year in the development lab for this Mariners organization. Granted, as you can see, we weren't focused on the very challenging programs this year. Uh, we were quite honestly looking for a potentially higher success rate with stuff that was easier to improve upon. Maybe not necessarily as impactful as some of those programs that were going to be much more difficult, but if we're able to have a 75% plus success rate again on the programs overall, which uh, seems realistic for us, I'll view it as a pretty successful time in the development lab. And now we've just got to kind of figure whether we want to send um, Young and Soto back in for a third time in a smaller program, or maybe, um, you know, think about Castillo, Newcomer Bichette, Logan Gilbert. Uh, is there something we can do with those players over the next four or five weeks that would be impactful to their potential performance in 2026 as well? And we're going to give the youngster Cole Young a third program. Um, you can see this offseason we've attempted um, both the improved defense at second base and the base stealing technique programs. He's been successful with both of those. And we're going to round things out by working on his base running fundamentals. So we're going to select that program for him. And then we're going to do something more challenging. We're going to uh, move on from Soto at this point. He had the opportunity to, you know, continue working on um, base stealing technique, learn new position or bunting drills after he was successful in improving his left field defense and his base running fundamentals. But we're going to roll the dice on Bo Bichette. Um, Certainly no guarantees that he's going to be successful improving his defense at shortstop over the next four to five weeks. But he is still only 27 years old, at least while he's going to be going through this program. He's got high adaptability, high work ethic. If there's ever a chance for us to be successful with this program with him, it's probably now rather than a year or two from now. So we're going to go ahead and select that. And certainly if we could have him tighten up his defense at the six even more uh, that would be a very positive development but certainly recognize that the probability of success for that program is lower than most of these shorter programs that we've been working on over this off season And Mr. Matsura has signed with the Blue Jays, uh, so he's no longer an option. Ended up getting a three-year deal at $11.1 million a year for a very good left-handed reliever, at least with the way relievers are getting paid thus far in OOTP 25. I don't think it's a horrible contract by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I don't think it's a great contract either. It's fine. It's certainly a contract that he could live up to. I don't think it's going to be a contract that you look back at what he provides over the next three years and think that the Blue Jays got a massive bargain. Um, but I think it's hard for most relievers to put up numbers that you would view as a massive bargain at over $11 million a year. And it looks like they are going to have him in that closer role. Uh, Savale has told us that he favors the offer now. So I'll still be happy if we get him locked up. Again, I felt like a right-hander who could start for us. Probably a bit more valuable than a lefty like Puck or even Matsura out of the bullpen for us. We'll find out over the course of this year and the years to come whether we regret that thought process and potential decision-making. Uh, but at this point, Savale certainly looks like the best pitcher who's still out there. So hopefully we'll be able to lock him up at this point. And uh, just a couple of higher end, meaning three-star potential position players out there at this point. 
in Joey Gallo and Tavi Edmond. Edmond has been coming back from an injury, uh, but with the addition of Bichette and the infielders that we have on our team would view a player like that as an absolute luxury. If Edmond's still on the market two months from now and he's only looking for half of what he's looking for, certainly would consider bringing him on board, but at this point, um, I think Savale is kind of all we're really focused on in free agency. And then uh, some of these names who are left on the market, some who have been very familiar to us over the first two years of this playthrough, Brown, Belt, Andrews, TA. If these guys linger on the market and start looking for minor league contracts, I think there's a number of guys who we'd certainly consider bringing into camp as we get closer to heading to Arizona. And we've made it to the start of the international amateur free agent signing period. Still waiting to hear from Mr. Savale on whether he's going to uh, sign the contract with us or not. It's been closing in on a month since this episode began, and we made that offer to him. So hopefully we'll get that resolved relatively soon. But our attention turns to the future now. And those of you who have watched our mini-series with the Yankees and now the Mariners know that our approach, given the incredibly high-end and very deep pools of potential players in these international amateur free agent periods has generally been to just try to lock up the guy that we love the most. And we've done that reasonably successful here in Seattle at this point. Because so when we look at our player development, uh, Jesus Ayala, a shortstop who we picked up uh, last year, is viewed as the number one prospect in all of baseball. Um, so I still think there's a bit of an imbalance, in my opinion, in terms of the quality of the IAFA players and their highest upside versus the quality of the players that have been available in these initial amateur drafts in the game. I'm hoping that that is still something that the um, developers address in the upcoming patch, which I think may be out this coming week. Uh, try to get a little bit of a better balance there for before we begin our long-term save. If not, it's something I can tweak in the settings to make it more palatable to me, perhaps, in terms of how that balance is. But to me, it still seems so dramatically in favor of the high potential international amateur free agent players versus uh, the lack of high potential high school and college domestic players available in the draft that I still think there's some work to be done there. But rather than just going after one player uh, this time, we're going to try to take advantage of these stupidly deep IAFA pools we do have the middle amount of $5.23 million available and set aside for the Mariners this year. So I think I'm going to look to offer uh, a couple of players pretty attractive contracts and see if uh, maybe we can lock up two guys that we really like rather than one. And who knows, maybe we'll end up with three of these guys that we've been scouting pretty aggressively over the last three plus months. And we are going to try to blow a few people away with offers that are higher than their demands. I don't know how successful this is going to be because uh, there are plenty of teams that have more money than we have available. And there are just these exceptional potential prospects out there that it may be hard for us, even if we blow people away with our initial offers, to land two plus of them. But a lot of these mini-series is just kind of learning more about the game for myself and also trying to put the team into some different positions than maybe you've gone into in your international amateur free agent periods thus far in the game. So we all learn a little bit more about 
how the game works and doesn't work. Grantedly, admittedly, anecdotally in small sample size, but it's still something interesting to look at. So Frank Cuellar is going to be the expensive guy that we go after. Uh, the left-handed hitting right fielder just has a potentially incredible bat. Speed, nothing exceptional. Personality, nothing exceptional. Defense, nothing exceptional. But the bat, if fully developed, is potentially exceptional. We've got a very strong relationship with him. Ton of league interest in a player like that, obviously, uh, which is also um, not going to necessarily make it easy for us to sign him. He says he's looking for $3.4 million. We are actually going to offer him $4.1 million. Um, so we're going about 20% over what he claims he's looking for. I think it's very conceivable he goes for 4.75, maybe even the full 5.23 we have, and maybe even more than we can ultimately pay. But we'll try to make a strong offer to him at the outset as one big player that we're going to go after. And then we're going to make two other offers to guys that just aren't looking for huge money that we like a lot. And one is the third baseman, Luis Contreras. Uh, I don't understand why this guy is looking for so little money. He's probably my favorite player in the draft. He's a right-handed hitter. Um, not quite the same type of power bat as the outfielder, but potentially still exceptional gap power. Borderline exceptional ability to draw walks. Incredible speed to lash extra base hits all over the field plus some good home run power, really good personality traits. Not a great defensive player, but at 6'4", with those ratings, he could probably be a borderline great defensive first baseman if we were willing to try uh, putting the right-hander at first base. Might not be optimal, and uh, might ultimately end up as a DH for us, or a mediocre third baseman or a mediocre corner outfielder generally and i certainly can't recall having tried it in 25 doesn't always work if you tr if you try to put a right-handed fielder at first base but um it would be something that we could at least explore in the minors um and he's just not looking for much money at all so we're going to offer him a contract as well. Says he's looking for two hundred fifty thousand. We're going to offer him more than double of that at four fifty at this point, and see if maybe we can get what we would think is a bargain on him. And then last but not least, uh, we're going to go for a pitcher that we like, who's also not looking for a ton. Juan Espinosa, strong relationship with him. League interest in him is actually low. Um, but he's a guy who we think could have above average stuff, movement, and control. Uh, could have a 2-4 two, two, pitch arsenal, so he may end up being just a solid right-handed bullpen arm. But if those four pitches all develop, he's got the stamina to be a starter. Got some positive personality traits. A little older, closing in on 19 for an IAFA player. He's looking for three hundred grand. we are going to just offer him exactly what he's looking for right now. He's certainly the third in terms of our interest among the three players that we're making an offer to. But want to at least get the conversation going with him as well. And we'll see if maybe um, between Cuellar, Contreras, and Espinoza, we're able to maybe lock up uh, two of these three players in the coming weeks. Looks like both Contreras and Espinosa favor our offer to start. Cuellar, not shockingly, is uh, probably going to be a little more circumspect in sharing what he's thinking with us, given that, as I noted, he's got the opportunity to uh, possibly be making the full $5.7 million from somebody, which is a number that uh, we wouldn't be able to compete with unless we traded for some IAFA space. 
And my, how the turntables have turned in just a matter of a couple of days. Uh, Cuellar has gotten back to us and says he now favors the offer. Perhaps not surprisingly, both Contreras and Espinosa say they want more money. Uh, we'll offer, well, we'll at least see what Contreras is looking for at this point. Says he's looking for 640000 We'll offer him six fifty. Now he says he wants six seventy. Is much uh, I really do like super like Contreras, and I think it is conceivable that Quayar may end up looking for more than we can ultimately afford to pay. I think if I can only sign one guy probably have to go with this ridiculous bat in terms of the contact and the home run power with Cuellar. But right now I'm still going to try to be greedy and thread the needle of maybe trying to get them both on board. I don't necessarily think it's going to happen, but there's no reason to cast aside all our dreams just a couple of days into this IAFA period. And June 20th, or January 20th, 2026, uh, potentially big, bay, big day in the history of the Seattle organization. We've got Savale signed, and we also signed Frank Cuellar. So I think that aggressive um, $4.1 million bid on him at the start ended up working out for us. Um, now the question is whether we'll be able, with the $1.1 million-ish we have left, to ultimately supplement him with... Perhaps Contreras, which would be an incredible duo of position players to get. But if things fell through with Contreras and Espinosa was still out there, um, that would not be a bad fallback plan. But pretty excited to have Savali on board to really lengthen our rotation and give us some depth in the event of injuries. And uh, also like that we've brought on a potentially exceptional hitter into the organization with the offer that we made to Cuellar. And we did get Contreras signed as well, uh, so he agreed to that $700,000 offer that we made to him. So given the uh, potential that we see with him, the fact that we love the personality, the speed, the bat. Uh, as I talked about, I don't know <laughs> that we've got a natural position for him as a uh, right-hander. Seems like third base or a real horrible left fielder or a unicorn first baseman are our best hopes. Honestly, he's potentially a designated hitter, but if that bat fully develops, he is uh, one heck of a DH. So pretty excited to have uh, both Contreras and Cuellar on board. We've still got a little bit of money left. Um, so we'll keep playing around with international amateur free agency. Just $430,000 left at this point. So that's not going to, I believe, get us Espinoza. Yeah, he's looking for more than that. But still certainly um, was able to get two incredibly high-end five-star potential prospects signed in this IAFA period already, which is a uh, pretty successful result from my perspective, and bring in Mr. Savale on board, also a very successful result. So I like what we've done over, I guess it's been exactly a month at this point. I think it was December 22nd at the start of this episode. And given that uh, my lack of sleep and lack of rest is beginning to uh, hit me a little harder, I think we're going to call it an episode here. Next time around, we will uh, hopefully get all the way to the start of the season. So we're going to start uh, picking with minor league contracts at some of these guys that we've talked about. Edmund, the number, is coming down a little bit. Pitcher-wise, um, not necessarily a lot of high-end guys left, but there are guys who could probably be useful organizational depth for us that we are going to look at as well in the coming weeks. 
So we're glad to be back. We'll start uh, hopefully getting out some more episodes, and uh, hopefully we're not too far away from being able to start our long-term sim. Although I'd still love another patch. Actually, I'm going to wait for another patch before we get that. And I'd also love to have a game manual by the time we get that as well. And certainly if the uh, patch ends up addressing some of the imbalances and concerns and idiosyncrasies that we've outlined in this and other episodes, that will make it even more likely that uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks we'll be able to announce and begin our long-term play. But until then, we're having fun with the Mariners. We are definitely a win-now team with the moves that we've continued to make. And uh, 500 record is not going to be acceptable here in 2026. And we're going to start finding out uh, what this team looks like on the field in the not-so-distant future. Until then, thanks so much for watching, and hope you have a great day.